coming on today. Excited to have you here on the workbench. Um, really excited to dig into your business, Bonnie and a broom and hear all about the background and how you got that off the ground. So h- how are you doing today? How's everything going? Yeah, good. Thank you. No, um, things are going well. We've got some family in town and uh, things are going really well over here. So yeah, excited to talk about it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, my pleasure. So yeah, I guess to kick things off, let's talk a little bit about Bonnie and a broom. And can you start just by introducing yourself and telling folks a bit about the business that you run? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Logan Robinson. Um, I am a former W2 nine to five employee as of two weeks, as of actually literally just on Friday is when I quit my job. So uh, yeah, this is uh, hot off the press, fresh news. Um, I've been running a residential cleaning business for a about a year and three months now. Um, and that's really what has able, enabled me to quit my job. So it's it's been awesome. But Bonnie and a Broom um, was started out just as residential cleaning, but now we focus specifically uh, just on Airbnb. So we only do vacation rentals. And uh, we're, we're located in Northwest Arkansas. Understood. Well, congrats on breaking free of the nine to five shackles, as some people view them. <laughs> what were you doing sure. uh, for the day job before going full time on your entrepreneurial endeavor? Yeah, I won't get too detailed here, but I was working for a, a fairly massive retailer that's based in Arkansas. There's only one, so it's pretty easy to know which one it is. Um, but I was on, uh, I was in their merchandising org, and so. For those, if those of you that aren't familiar with retail, um, merchants are the folks that determine what to sell at the store. So they're the they're the buyers, right? So they meet with suppliers, they determine what items to sell, they choose the retail price, and ultimately they get those items on the shelves. So the the merchants at at a retailer really kind of run the show. Um, obviously, then you have the operators as well. Um, and so I was in merchandising, specifically in the pets area. And my job within merchandising was to be kind of an in-house entrepreneur um, for for this retailer. So really my job was, hey, this is the pets area. We want you to find new businesses to start uh, for the pets department. So I did that for the past two and a half years. Before that, I was in finance for two years at the same retailer. Love that. I love the pet industry, man. I think they're, I have a dog and I've just seen firsthand how much money people spend on their dogs. And that is a category I really love, both from a service standpoint, whether it's dog training, boarding, um, daycare, as well as a product standpoint. So we could probably do a whole nother podcast on the pet industry. Um, cause that's a, that's a great one. So, um, okay. So you you have a business here that does residential cleaning. It sounds like you mostly focus now on Airbnbs. Talk to us a little bit yep. around the inspiration for starting a cleaning business of of all the home services. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, it's it's a pretty interesting story. I think it's a unique story, uh, and I, I know that I've shared it a couple times. So, if, forgive me if um, your listeners have already heard this story before, but um, I think it's a cool story. So, I'll share it again. We, um, I was in, uh, I was in Las Vegas at my in laws' house, and. Uh, we were watching the show Undercover Billionaire, if you've ever heard of that show. And uh, it's basically the premise of the show is they take a they take a billionaire, right? And they drop him in the middle of America in this no-name town. And they basically give him a challenge to say, hey, your job is to start a business that's worth a million dollars in the next, I think it's like 90 days or something. But they change their name. They change their look. They, nobody knows who they are. Um, and their job is to start a business. So I'm sitting there with my, my brother-in-law. And we're thinking that would be super fun to do this, right? Like a super fun challenge that we could just, we're both very entrepreneurial. So we, we decided let's, let's do it. Um, and so we kind of set the ground rules and the ground rules are basically this. You got six weeks, it has to be a brand new business from scratch. You get a thousand dollars to start this with. Um, you can't tell anybody you're doing competition. You really just have to, have to kind of have to start this business. And the first one within six weeks to make, or the person at the end of six weeks, six weeks who's made the most money, uh, they win the challenge. And so we decided to do this and I invited a couple of friends to do it with me. Um, and it was, it was awesome. And the first five weeks of the six week competition, I made zero dollars, not a, not a penny, not a single dollar. <laughs> and so I was pretty discouraged. Uh, but the good thing was nobody else had made any money either. So we were all kind of like, oh, we're all terrible entrepreneurs because we've made zero dollars in five weeks and it's only a six week challenge. Um, but I'm pretty prideful. So I definitely wanted to win. 
anyway, a buddy of mine sent me a tweet that was like basically laying out step by step how to start a cleaning business. And I said, this is the last week. I've got to win this competition. So I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start a cleaning business just like right now. Uh, and so I literally had the website up the next day. I had my first customer two days later. It was a $500 job. Uh, so I made $500 at the end of that six weeks, won the competition. And then I thought, holy, holy cow, like this is, this literally took me three days to set up this cleaning business. And I've already made $500, obviously revenue. Um, and so my take home was just, you know, basically half that. And I thought that's, that's really pretty cool. And so from there, I just said, okay, it looks like I've got a business. And, you know, a year later, we did $100,000 last year revenue, just like, okay, we're doing this. So it's obviously part time, because I still had my full time job. Um, but that's kind of the story. Yeah, that's awesome. That That's an incredible story and, and super unique. And I love how a competition like that, it gamifies things and also makes you really focus on the critical path because as entrepreneurs, I think it's easy to get lost in doing all these yeah. big grand scales, but it's like, can you go make a dollar? Can you literally go make $1 yeah. or, you know, in your case, 500 bucks? Um, man, I think that is just a really, really cool approach. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd like to keep... touch on that for yeah, your... Go ahead. For your for your listeners, I think so. Your the audience for this is mostly aspiring home service business owners, right? And I think the um, the biggest thing that really kind of bothers me in this space, or maybe just kind of like um, frustrates me a little bit, is everybody thinks they have to have it figured out, and it has to be perfect before they can start. The website has to be perfect. The pricing has to be perfect. Like the the how you're actually going to perform the service has to be perfect, and that is so far from the truth. That that first customer that I got was literally two days after I decided to start a cleaning business, and I didn't know what to price it at. I think I priced him way differently than I would have priced him now. Now, but knowing what I know now, but like the the most important thing is that you just start. Like you just put your shingle out there and say, "Hey, I'm open for business. This is what I'm going to do." Um, and so the people that sit there and they spend three weeks or three months perfecting the website, like it's it's really tough to have a good business if that's your mentality. Absolutely. Yeah, totally agreed. Um, can you tell us about how you got that first customer? Like you put up the website, I think you said, and, and how did you actually get someone to get to that website and book a job with you? Can you walk us through that process? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, I think that's another key point too, is um, a lot of times entrepreneurs, especially early entrepreneurs are afraid to tell people that they're starting a business. And so they just don't talk about it. Um, I had told my buddy, the buddy that sent me the tweet about starting a cleaning business. I, so I said, I had, look, this business is up and running. Like we're good to go. And he overheard a coworker at work saying that he needed cleaning services. Um, and my friend told his coworker, Hey, my buddy's got a cleaning business. You should give him a call. And so he called me the next day we had the job. So it, it really came from telling people as well that you're starting this business because my first two or three customers came from friends of friends right so it's 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 not rocket science right it's just tell people love that okay so you you yeah. go through this competition you you win the competition by booking uh, your very first cleaning job um when you get that first job did you go and clean the house yourself or how did you service that that client yeah we would um we would not be in business today if i were <laughs> if i were the one that was actually doing the cleaning uh no so i um I found a cleaner and uh, what I did was I, I went on Facebook groups and in my church, my local con church congregation has a Facebook group. And I just posted in there saying, Hey, I'm looking for a cleaner. Does anybody have a recommendation? And it wasn't, I'm starting a business. It wasn't, you know, whatever. It was just, Hey, I'm looking for a cleaner. And then I immediately got like 15 responses of, Oh, you know, so-and-so cleans my house does a great job. So I set up interviews with some of these folks, got my, got the cleaner like day two, I had them do a test clean beforehand, um, and then they they did the job. They did the five hundred dollar job like in you know, two days later. So it was yeah, just sharing on Facebook groups looking for recommendations. Yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, so let's go through the process then from getting that first job booked um, through the the competition, reaching out to your kind of local network, and getting that that uh, you know that that employee so to speak out there to do the job. 
Um, talk to me about the next like three to six months and how you went from, okay, I just made 500 bucks to actually scaling this up to a repeatable um, real business. Yeah. So that, that first $500 was really pivotal because it, it taught me that this is a real possibility and it's something that I should, that I should chase after. Um, I never set out to start a cleaning business in my like, you know, fantasies as a kid, I wasn't like, I'm going to run a cleaning business and then I'm going to quit my job to go full time on this cleaning mm -hmm. business. Like that wasn't ever a thought. Um, and so that first $500 was pretty instrumental to be like, oh, this is a, a good business, even if it's not what I would like aspire to to do. Um, so got that $500 and then had the website up and running. So I know that I needed to run ads. Um, and so I really focused on Google local service ads. Um, which at the time were a lot more uh, reasonable than they are now. I think they, the cost of these local service ads has increased quite a bit, but Google local service ads, I'm sure your audience is familiar with it, but they're basically ads that say you're Google guaranteed, right? So you pass a background check, you provide proof of insurance, you have to get five reviews um, until Google says that you're a guaranteed business and then they run ads for you. Um, and then if a customer calls you, you know, you get charged for that lead. It was like $25 a lead. Now it's closer to probably $60 a lead. Um, and that's really what started cranking the business, right? So that's, that's what I would get most of my calls from. That was probably like 75, 80% of my business for a long, long time, was just those local service ads. And so we built up quite a big book of business on that. Um, you know, obviously close to hundred or over a hundred thousand dollars last year, just on kind of local service ads. Um, and so we just kept, we kept getting calls in, we kept booking the, booking the cleans, we kept sourcing the cleaners, sending the cleaners in to do the job, charging the customer. So it was pretty, it was a pretty simple process and a simple, not easy, right? It's, it's obviously very difficult. Um, but it's a simple process. So a customer calls me, give them a quote, they accept, collect payment information, send the cleaner out there, give them the checklist and, and you're kind of off to the races. So right. couldn't just, just kind of continued that for you know, for the first three to six months, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so Google LSA, very familiar with it. I know people have felt that it's a little pricey, like per lead. Yeah. Um, outside of that, what are some other ways that you either in the early days or still to this day are generating, you know, net new leads for top of funnel clients for the biz? Yeah. So LSA was the biggest one. Um, but then I also did yard signs. So I, I put out yard signs on street corners um, that was not nearly as successful as I had hoped it was going to be. I think we got like one customer off of that, but I think, I think it's because people are so used to seeing them that they just kind of like block them out. They don't even acknowledge them anymore. Um, we did Facebook ads. I thought Facebook ads were pretty good. Um, we probably got like two or three customers off of those. I did not run those for very long. I wish that is something I'd spent more time on was Facebook ads. And so I'm going to start focusing more on, on those as well. And then we did Google search ads. Um, we got a lot of clicks from Google search, but very few conversions. So really the best bang for our buck was local service ads until, you know, until they got super expensive. I still think though now, um, even if the leads are still, you know, $60, $60 a lead, if you've got a high conversion rate, like if you're, if you're closing 50% of those jobs, um, that's still worth it to me, right? So you, you spend 60 bucks on a lead, you close 50%. So you spend $120 to get a customer. That $120, your first clean, if it's a big house, you've already made $120 back, right? So you kind of break even on that first clean. And if it's a recurring customer, I mean, you're going to win that money back over um, several times over. So I, I, I would not totally discount local services ads right now. I still think if your conversion rate's high, I think it, I think it still makes sense. Understood. Understood. Um, okay. So it sounds like you started off cleaning individual resident re residences, going to someone's home and, and cleaning their house for them. And then it sounds like yeah. more recently you've pivoted to cleaning Airbnbs. I'm guessing partnering with the host, the person who owns the home and is leasing it out on Airbnb. Can you talk to us a little bit about that transition and, and what even got you thinking, oh, maybe I should go clean Airbnbs instead of you know someone's house, someone's personal home? Yeah, it's a great question. It's obviously kind of the biggest change that I've made in my business. Um, uh, so we operated as doing residential, mostly residential, but we also did like a lot of weird jobs, right? So we did um, 
residential customers. Then we also cleaned a clubhouse for a while. We cleaned a motel for a while. Um, we were cleaning Airbnbs. So we had lots of different service offerings, right? And that was great just starting out because that means we would accept every job and we'd get you know high volume. Um, but it really was not the best way to operate a business because you, you could never be really, really good at one thing, right? You were always consistently changing back and forth with checklists. And so I, I took a really strategic lens of my business and said, what do we want to be known for, right? Like, what do we want to have the reputation for um, in our area? And I looked at my best cleaners, you know, the cleaners that I thought performed the highest, they were trained Airbnb cleaners. So they had only done Airbnbs and they only wanted to do Airbnbs. Um, and then I looked at my customers. And so I took a spreadsheet of my customers and said, these customers have paid me the most amount of money since we started this business. And sure enough, they were Airbnb customers. Um, and so I really kind of took that and I said, okay, well, um, my best customers, my best cleaners are Airbnb cleaners. My highest paying customers are Airbnb customers. But it's also, Airbnb is also the hardest cleaning job I think there is. Um, so I know that competition is going to be lower. So I said at that time, I think this was in September, I really just kind of put my foot down and said, we are only going to do Airbnb cleans from now on. Um, and that's what I really wanted to be known for was just Airbnb. Um, and so I immediately s stopped accepting every other type of job. We kept our residential customers because we obviously didn't want to burn that bridge. Um, but we, from that time on, stopped accepting new jobs that were not Airbnb. And I think that's really been a great decision for us, mostly because we are now starting to be recognized and have a brand of, if you have an Airbnb, this is the cleaning company you want to work with, right? So we really niche down and, and now we have a good reputation in the area for being a really great cleaning company for this one specific niche. So it's something that I recommend. Um, to all all home service businesses is to really you know start broad and accept any type of job that comes your way because at the end of the day you're just trying to keep the lights on but after a while you really should niche down and really become known for one specific thing mm -hmm. all right got it so i'm guessing that the process to book Maybe it's the same, but I would assume, you know, Brian, homeowner, going to find a cleaner for my personal home, maybe it's a little different than if I'm an Airbnb owner, and yeah. especially if I maybe own like a portfolio of Airbnbs. Um, is is the kind yeah. of lead to customer process the same across those two customer bases? Is it different? And if it is different, can you talk about the different approaches there? Yeah. Um, so residential cleaning... Um, really does feel more transactional, to be honest, uh, where they come in and they just say, hey, you know, we want to book a cleaning so that we give them the price. And it's kind of just done right there. And if they like the price, they'll go with us or not. Uh, they'll go with us if they like the price. And so the relationship kind of ends there, right? Like we come in, we do the job, and then it's it's pretty much over unless there's a problem. Like we really don't hear from each other, which I don't think is really the best approach, but for Airbnb, it truly is more of a partnership. And so the vetting process is much longer. So when we get a call for an Airbnb clean, um, that first phone call does not solidify the business. That first phone call is the initial, like, let's build a relationship because those Airbnb owners are business owners, right? And so they want to make sure that whoever they're partnering with is going to be a good fit for them. Whereas with a residential customer, you know, they just fire you and move on. But with an Airbnb cleaner, if you mess up one clean, that Airbnb owner gets a bad review, and then that is really bad for the business. So when we get calls for Airbnb cleaning, it really is more of a building a relationship and building a level of trust before we do any job for them, before we do any work. Um, so our, web, our website's the same. Um, obviously, the copy's changed, but customers will now call us, and we'll start to develop that relationship, get to know them. We'll go out and visit their property. We'll look at their listing. We'll get to know what are the unique aspects of this property. And so that we can tailor our offering and tailor our cleaning to that specific property and really build that trust. Um, so the sales funnel is probably very similar, um, but the actual conversion process is very different. It's longer with Airbnb. And I think there's more riding on it. There's more at stake. Um, but those Airbnb customers, I mean, uh, with a residential customer, the max you're getting is you know, two times a month. I mean, maybe once a week, but it's, it's really rare with an Airbnb customer. 
we might be cleaning that property two times a week during busy season. Uh, so eight times a month. And I, so I think that relationship mm -hmm. is much more, much more important. So. Oh. No, I love that. And that, that's such a good insight that um, repeatability of the Airbnb customer is way higher than, um, you know, residential yeah. who may just want their house clean once or twice a month. Um, can you talk at all about like pricing and packaging for an Airbnb clean compared to residential? And is, do they get a discount because you're coming so frequently? Do you just basically say, do you charge per clean? However much you're willing to share with like yeah. actually breaking out pricing for an Airbnb customer, given that, hey, you may be there multiple times a week cleaning, cleaning their spot. Yeah, so there's no discount. <laughs> there's no, and I say that because uh, Airbnb cleaning really is challenging. It really is a, a tough work, and the reason that it is so much more tough than a residential clean is a residential clean. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect, and it's never going to be perfect, right? Because that house is lived in, and when somebody comes home from the resident for to, to the house they know that it's not going to be perfect. When somebody walks into an Airbnb, they're expecting it to be perfect, right? If you have one hair on the bathtub, you're going to hear about it, right? Like, so th those Airbnb cleans are much more high stake. Um, and so, no, we do not discount. Um, so we charge uh, price per square foot. And so it ranges, we have a minimum, we have a minimum clean, um, that's typically, I mean, it used to be 125. Our minimum clean now is 150. Um, and so we're typically only cleaning really higher end Airbnb properties. And so it's, you know, minimum clean of 150 and then it's a price per square foot. I think our lowest is if it's a really big house, I think it's like 85 cents a square foot, um, or sorry, 8.5 8 cents a square point, a square foot. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of our pricing model. And so those, because those the thought process is though that the Airbnb guest is going to pay for that cleaning fee. Now, whether or not that owner puts all that cost onto the guest or not, is kind of the owner's decision. But for us, we're saying, if you want us to come in, turn over this property, do all the laundry, refill all the supplies and make it look like nobody else has ever stepped foot in this house, this is going to be the price. Um, and you've got value Airbnb owners where they just own a small Airbnb that's maybe a, a three bedroom, two bath, and it's just their old house and it's not really well taken care of. And they're, they're not going to work with us because we're, we're so much more expensive. But if you've got a million dollar property that is absolutely beautiful and your guests that are coming are higher end, you're going to pay for that clean to be perfect because you know that guest is going to really want a good experience. Um, so we, we do charge a lot. Um, but I also pay my cleaners really well. My, I think I pay my cleaners probably. So the average hourly rate from what I'm seeing in my area for a cleaner is like 20 bucks an hour. Um, I guarantee my cleaners at least $25 an hour. And a lot of times they make close to $30 an hour. Um, so I pay my cleaners really well because I want the best cleaners and I charge really high prices because I want the best properties. So that's, that's kind of gives you a little flavor. If you can't tell, I'm pretty passionate about it. <laughs> so that's kind of the, the flavor of the differences between residential and, and Airbnb. Yeah, that's really insightful and makes sense that you want to, the, like the, the parameters for a clean Airbnb are different than the parameters for a clean home when it's your house and yeah. you kind of need to, um, you know, pay attention to that. It, let's talk about hiring. So I love that you're, you know, you're paying top of market yeah. to get top of market talent. Um, can you talk to us about how you go about hiring and finding great cleaners to execute these high quality jobs? Yeah, we, um, we have a pretty thorough process for, for getting good cleaners on our staff. Um, so we, we start top of funnel, like everybody else, just on Indeed, um, or on Facebook groups, just posting that we have, you know, job options. We work with only excuse me, independent contractors. Um, so we get a ton of applicants, right? But we, we really focus on, do they have professional cleaning experience, right? So because we work with independent contractors, we're, we're not training them. Um, they have to come in pre-trained. And so we get a lot of applicants that have worked for Two Maids and a Moth, Molly Maid, other cleaning companies. And then we um, do a background check, call references, put them through a test clean, and then if they are able to pass all those steps, then we'll bring them on and, you know, call them one of our preferred providers for our, for our cleaning business. But it really starts with um, 
you know, starts with a good indeed post about what, what are the benefits of working for your company? So for, for my company, the benefits of working for us are you get to be in really nice houses all day. Like we really clean, really nice properties. So cleaners love that. Um, but cleaners also love the fact that we let, com we do complete flexible scheduling, obviously. So if we assign you a job and you don't want it, you can decline it. And that's not a big deal. Um, so if you don't want to work on Saturdays, you'll never have to work a Saturday. Um, we pay weekly, which is huge. We don't do, we don't do every two weeks. We do every single week. We give bonuses based on quality control checks. So a cleaner, from a cleaning perspective, we make it really attractive to come and work for us. And that's not even including the fact that you're getting paid, you know, five or $10 more per hour than you would at a typical cleaning job. So we try to do our best to make it as attractive as possible. Does that do great things for our bottom line? Probably not in the short term, but I think in the long term, it really does pay off. I think that's a great approach because ultimately the quality of the clean is going to come down to the person doing the cleaning. And if the person doing yeah. the cleaning is happy and feels well supported and well compensated, I'd imagine that the quality of work is going to be that much better. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that these, I mean, I'll, I'll speak specifically to cleaners, but maybe just blue collar workers in general, they, these jobs that they're doing are pretty thankless, right? They don't get a lot of praise. They only hear about things when they go wrong. Um, so when we do quality control checks, which are pretty frequent in our business, we give, we give 10% bonuses. If it's a, if it's an outstanding job, we'll give a 10% bonus. Um, we do, we provide some grace. And so even if there's a couple of things that aren't correct, we'll still pay the full amount. Um, so we, we really try to make our cleaners feel valued. And because of that, we have very, very low turnover. We've only had like out, out of my core cleaning team, we've only had one that I've had to let go or stop working with in the past year and three months. Great. That's a great stat right there. And sure, I'm sure something that potential cleaners are uh, excited to see. Uh, yeah. Shifting gears a little bit to tools and technology. Um, you know, we hear about all different types of tech, whether it's Jobber, House Call Pro, different marketing tools, different quoting tools, um, website builders, you name it. Um, can you give us a rundown of the tech stack that's powering Bonnie and a Broom today? Yeah. Uh, sure. I'm not as technically sound as I should be, right? So I don't use any of those tools that you just mentioned. Um, Booking Koala was where I started. So my website is hosted by Booking Koala. And when I was doing residential, that was, was driving the quote form. Um, was Booking Koala and it worked great. And I still use Booking Koala today because we still have a couple of residential customers. My So my website still hosted on that. My quote form is an Excel sheet that I have written the formula for. I'm a finance guy. So I have an Excel sheet and that has the, that has the input cell. And then I've got like, you know, five different formulas to calculate what the actual price is. So that's, that's pretty embarrassing that I'm writing the quote form off an Excel spreadsheet, but that's just how I'm wired, I guess. So the Excel is for my quote form. I don't have a CRM. I use also Excel for my CRM. So now you're really showing my weaknesses of, I don't use a lot of tools. Um, I use open phone for my phone, which is, which is awesome. I love the they have an automatic reply feature when it's after hours or on, you know, and, uh, or if I'm on a call. So that's awesome. So open phone, booking Koala, uh, my, my software for my, my Airbnb cleaning business is Breezeway. Breezeway is made specifically for property management companies, but I use it just for cleaning and it's really awesome because you can add checklists, uh, you integrate with their Airbnb calendar. So I see all the bookings that are coming up and it schedules cleans automatically. So I, I love Breezeway. Um, those are really it. I mean, um, I don't, I don't do a ton of other tech. Uh, my tech stack is pretty, pretty, pretty limited. So, um, maybe there are other ones that I'm missing. Less is more, less is more. And Hey, so yeah, less yeah. is more. And if it's working for you, it's working for you. So no need to bloat the, uh, monthly cost there with some fancy tech that you may not be using. Um, Okay. And then, yeah, looking yeah. forward, where are, where's the future of Bonnie and the Broom? Where do you want to see this business one, five, 10 years from now, especially knowing now that this has your full focus? What are the goals and future plans for the business? 
Yeah, this is the full focus. Uh, this is getting 100% of my effort. Um, that's not true. I do have a couple other side products that I'm working on as well, but this is getting the, the bulk of my effort. Yeah. Um, the goal is this. I did So I did $100,000 last year top line, which I know you're going to have some people that say, oh, that's not very much. For me, that was awesome. As like a first time business owner, or whatever, I was, I'm stoked about that. And so this year, this year, the goal is $300,000. Uh, I'd love to see a net profit margin of 30%. So I'd love to be able to take home a hundred grand of profit this year. Uh, I think that's possible. And I'm trying to, that's, you know, I'm trying to keep expenses low so I can get there. So top line this year, 300 K bottom line, hundred K um, that's, that would be year two, full year, full calendar year two. Uh, I mean, I don't know. The goal I think would be, I think it's a pretty cool franchise concept idea. So if I really did want to expand it, I would definitely look at franchising. I think it's unique. I don't think there are other franchise out, franchises out there that focus on just on Airbnb. So I think that'd be a unique franchise concept. But uh, my vision is really kind of set on just this year. And how do I get to 300K this year? So, yeah, that's Love not that. as Super well thought actionable. out as it should be. Yeah, no, I think it's no, I think it's great, actionable, approachable, um, cool man. And then rounding it out, if I were, you know, in a position where I said, "Hey, I want to start an Airbnb cleaning business tomorrow. I want to get out of my nine to five. Mm-hmm. This is something I want to do." I just heard Logan's story. Yeah. I'm going to follow that path. What are like the one to three things you would tell me uh, in terms of advice when I when I'm getting this off the ground? Yeah. Um, the, the biggest thing that I will tell you, and I've said this so many times, but there, <clears throat> every business has its issues, right? Airbnb cleaning is not perfect. In fact, I think it's really challenging. Um, but I would say like, regardless of the issues, you need to kind of look at what you want to do and just pick one, just pick a lane and just go as deep and as far as you can. If you want to do Airbnb cleaning business, cleaning business, that's great. If you want to do residential, that's great. If you want to do landscaping, you know, awesome. Every business is going to have problems and every business is going to not be perfect. So pick one and go as deep as possible. And I would just say, just start, right? So very first thing that I would do is, is try to find cleaners. So post on every single Facebook, every single community in America has a Facebook group entitled Airbnb owners, VRBO owners, short-term rental owners of XYZ City. So if I'm in Austin, Texas, which I'm not, but there's guaranteed a Facebook group that's called Airbnb owners of Austin, Texas. Join that group, um, be in that group, be in that community, post on there saying, hey, I'm looking for a good cleaner. Okay, you're going to get 15 responses of people saying, I clean Airbnbs, whatever. Start to interview them, start to talk to them. As soon as you have a really good cleaner locked down, I would go on Airbnb. This is not, I do not do this today, uh, but this is how I would get my very first customer. You're going to make a lot of people mad, uh, but you kind of get to got, got to get your foot in the door some way. Have a good cleaner. You go on Airbnb. You look at all the houses in your area and you go to, to book a reservation at one of these houses. You're not actually booking the reservation. You're just trying to message the host. That's where people are going to get mad because they're going to get a notification that says, you know, so-and-so Logan wants to book your place. In that message, you say, hey, you know, I'm really sorry this comes across as a booking. I know that's really frustrating for you. I just started a cleaning business. I'm just trying to get my first customer. Would love to give you a quote on cleaning your property. Um, That's exactly how I would do it to get my very first customer. And I think, yeah, you're going to make, if you message a hundred people, maybe 50 of them are going to cuss you out, but maybe 50 of them will listen to you. Right. So, um, that's, that's exactly how I do it. Those get a, get a cleaner from Facebook, get a customer from the Airbnb website and you're kind of on the way right there. Love that man. Super straightforward, super actionable. Uh, Logan, we appreciate you coming on. Uh, let the folks know where they can find you on social media, where they can check out your business, all that good stuff. So um, the listeners and readers can take a look at what you got going on. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm pretty active on Twitter. So uh, at Logan A. Robison, that's R-O-B-I-S-O-N. <clears throat> on Twitter, that's probably where you'll find me the most. And then, yeah, that's if you have questions about Airbnb cleaning, feel free to reach out. Um, happy to help. Thanks, Brian.
Thank you, Logan. Uh, have a good rest of your day and hope you have a great weekend. And uh, yeah, appreciate you coming on, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you.